Hello, my name is Scott Shell. I'm the University of Wyoming Extension Entomology Specialist and today I'd like to talk to you about a, a new pest that's found its way to Wyoming and it's, it's one of those things that seems inevitable. This uh, uh, Japanese beetle uh, has been making its way uh, across the country from the East Coast and uh, it would eventually find its way here and I'd like to share some more information with you so we can uh, determine if it's uh, anywhere else in Wyoming and if it's possible to uh, stop it and eradicate it before it gets widespread and established. This is just the standard extension service disclaimer that uh, if we mention products uh, that there's no intended uh, endorsement of that product. Uh, the Japanese beetles were found at uh, Sheridan, Wyoming's Kendrick Park by some sharp-eyed uh, parks employees and uh, these s samples were sent off to the USDA APHIS Plant Protection Quarantine identifier to make sure that they were Japanese beetles and from there uh, they've tried to uh, uh, figure out the best path forward and see if they can eradicate them. And initially uh, one of those things was a resolution about the uh, uh, infestation urging people to uh, citizens to uh, cease irrigation and watering of lawns. Uh, this is a way to help control in, uh, the invasive Japanese beetles. So the Japanese beetles, if they weren't so darn destructive, uh, are a relatively pretty insect. They were accidentally introduced in the U.S. from their native Japan, probably in the plant trade. Uh, it, back in New Jersey in 1916 was kind of the first official record of their presence. So probably they were chewing on somebody's roses there, uh, one of their favorite foods. Uh, none of our native scarab beetles look anything like the Japanese beetle as far as its coloration. Uh, they have an iridescent green head and uh, uh, pronotum and then reddish brown elytra which are the front wings are modified into the hard covers for their body and these five tufts of white hair uh, along each side of their abdomen uh, so very distinctive about the size of a, a nickel in, 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 uh, from head to tail. Uh, besides liking to chew on roses, they will feed on over 300 species of plants. Uh, they do like to feed on flowers, but they also feed on foliage. And a lot of uh, their host plants are, are ornamentals, but they also will feed on some of our uh, crop plants and, and fruit trees and those types of things. So they can be extremely damaging in some situations <clears throat> as adults. A uh, distinctive feature about the adults eating is uh, they do what's called skeletonization of the leaves. Uh, uh, they're kind of the picky eaters of the insect world. They'll leave behind the tough veins and uh, eat the tender uh, parts in between them. Uh, so that certainly that's also a way to, to help distinguish them from other types of uh, common insects that we have uh, is that distinctive pattern of feeding. The immature form or larvae of beetles, um, also uh, can be termed grubs, uh, are uh, pests of turf. That's what they, they live in that soil and root zone and chew on the roots of turf grasses, especially well watered turf grasses. Back east, uh, you know, they can have uh, a very lush turf without artificial watering. Here in the West uh, generally requires some artificial watering unless it's in a riparian zone. Uh, so they will be uh, a problem uh, in golf courses and uh, parks and lush lawns. That's why the uh, city tried to um, have people cut out the watering during a period uh, uh, to help interfere with the Japanese beetles life cycle. So by drying out that turf during the period when the Japanese beetle eggs and first stage larvae that have just hatched from the eggs are near the surface, uh, you can cause a lot of, of mortality in that generation and help reduce the numbers the, for the following year. Uh, that's a type of uh, uh, management called uh, cultural control where you alter the environment. It's a, a good 
thing to include with IPM because it's uh, uh, anything that you can do to help reduce the population uh, without causing undue harm to other things is, is a helpful step in trying to control a pest. So the Japanese beetle life cycle is a one-year life cycle uh, so the adults uh, after they've laid eggs in, in, in the late summer they will die uh, and then the next generation will start out uh, they'll hatch and start feeding on the roots and get uh, bigger and go deeper in the soil uh, at later in the year and then they will uh, come back up the next spring start feeding again on the uh, grasses of the turf when the ground is thawed and then they will pupate in order to transform into the adult stage and the adults are present during the summer months so uh, again just a annual life cycle and that's um, uh, you know you to do control you need to understand the life cycles and where you can do appropriate tactics to try to uh, reduce their populations well, finding the Japanese beetle population early in Sheridan, while it's still small, uh, bodes well for answering this question. It, it, there are models of eradication that, that it has been done where Japanese beetles have been found and then eliminated. Uh, but it, uh, and there are other models where it didn't happen. So essentially, uh, the, the thing in favor of Sheridan getting rid of them is they found them early and so that's really the basis of this whole presentation is try to make everybody aware of what the Japanese beetle looks like and why it's a problem and if you see it uh, why we should uh, be notified uh, uh, and everybody make an effort to try to, to eradicate it. So this map illustrates uh, the states, uh, essentially the east of the Mississippi River, uh, uh, have been long-term general infestations and establishment of the Japanese beetle. And then you have the uh, other states that have um, uh, the hash marks of green on them uh, that show there's localized infestations. And uh, uh, this map is from, I think, 2018. And it is um, uh, not quite current because now we would have a localized infestation and uh, uh, it did not show that there is also been infestations around Billings that they haven't been able to eradicate. They've limited their spread, but uh, there's still Japanese beetles uh, they think will come in uh, uh, at the near the Billings Airport. Uh, Japanese beetles, for some strange reason, are attracted to the smell of jet fuel and so they will uh, go on to airports and then uh, unfortunately get um, into jet airplanes cargo planes and then get transported around rapidly and and that's how they think they got them in billing so that could be the possible point of introduction is perhaps um, you know Japanese beetle uh, hitched a ride from Billings down to Sheridan which is not that far away or somebody got um, you know a, a transplant with some soil that had Japanese beetle larvae in it and brought it back to Sheridan so who knows how they got it uh, certainly they think uh, on the front range of Colorado which has a well-established population now that uh, started in the 1990s now there has been two successes with eradication of uh, Japanese beetle one was at Palisade Colorado where they were first found in 2002 and they were eliminated uh, by 2013 uh, Orem, Utah found some in 2006 and were able to eliminate them uh, rather rapidly. But a new population of them has been found uh, near Salt Lake City in 2019 and then uh, out in Oregon in 2016 they're still fighting them. So again it is a, a difficult pest to deal with. Uh, they are um, you know because they have the larval stage in the soil uh, they can be transported uh, pretty easily in the plant trade. Uh, so certainly uh, areas that have uh, valuable uh, fruit growing industries, uh, you know, that makes them more vulnerable. It's another pest. And so certainly, uh, uh, you know, if we can eradicate them, that will be the best course of action. 
Uh, Palisade, Colorado was able to eradicate them and it's a very interesting story. It, it was a, a, a effort of the community. Uh, they had only one person that didn't want to cooperate with getting their uh, lawn treated or dried out in order to uh, uh, kill a Japanese beetle larva, but the rest of the community united. A part of that was there's a driving economic force there. Uh, peaches uh, are vulnerable to Japanese beetle damage. They will actually uh, chew on the ripening peaches and damage them. And, and you know, it's a huge uh, cash crop for the area. Uh, their climate is also such it's very hot and dry and they can't grow much unless it's irrigated. And, and so by being able to dry out the lawns, uh, you know, they don't kill the lawns, but they dry them out in that critical period. Uh, they also had a, a pest control district that uh, could uh, force anybody who, who wasn't uh, willing to participate, but uh, said uh, uh, in the, the write-up of the story of the Japanese beetle eradication, they only had one person that failed to uh, participate uh, uh, and, and was willing to participate. So certainly um, it can be done. So having the economic incentive of having um, uh, Japanese beetles damage uh, the crop production in a region, especially high value crops like uh, uh, food crops, uh, that gives a, a big incentive. And so Utah, their Department of uh, Food and Agriculture, uh, monitors for Japanese beetle pretty uh, regularly in a lot of areas and uh, they uh, were successful with eradicating a small infestation in Orem but then found a new one in 2019 and they only found 36 beetles in 2019 but that triggered uh, a, an eradication program so you know it doesn't come cheap to try to do this but they think uh, you know, spend a dollar today to save thousands tomorrow is, I, I think, the, the the thought. You can read more about their plan and uh, what they are, are putting forth to uh, eradicate the beetles. Yeah, like say they, it's a not uh, cheap program, but in the long term for them, it's going to be um, more economic to try to eradicate and hopefully be successful. Now, on the other hand, on the front range of Colorado, the Japanese beetle initially didn't do too well after it was found. They tried to, to eradicate it, then realized they were not getting uh, the kind of cooperation needed, and uh, it is spread quite widely on the front range. And initially, it wasn't that problematic, but they seem to have adapted uh, to the little bit harsher climate there uh, and are doing quite well now and are pretty problematic. So, in, in that situation where the eradication is not possible. What they're trying to do now is establish the biological controls of the beetle. So the Japanese beetle was brought here without all of the, the predators and parasites and things that uh, uh, and diseases that controlled its population back in its native range in Japan. And so uh, they're trying uh, what's called a classical biological control program where uh, going back uh, and exploring and learning about about the biology of the Japanese beetle in its home range, they have found uh, insects that are specific to it, uh, such as this uh, parasitic fly, a uh, tachinid fly that attacks the adults. It lays an egg on the adult beetles that hatches and then the, the maggot bores into the adult beetle and will eventually kill it. Uh, uh, there's also a parasitic wasp that will dig into the soil and, and lay an egg on uh, grub and then the egg hatches you can see here on the far right uh, and will uh, stay on the outside of the body but uh, essentially suck the body fluids out of the uh, Japanese beetle and then there's also been a, a fungal pathogen a disease organism of Japanese beetles that has been introduced uh, that has established since places in Colorado so the thought there is that uh, you know you can suppress their population to the point where they're not quite as problematic. Uh, you know, instead of having maybe a hundred Japanese beetles eating your uh, rose bush, you know, you'll have five, uh, and it just won't be as devastating of a pest. And and the other good thing about this is it once established. Uh, you know, it's low cost. 
but again, um, you know, it, the best course of action I think for Sheridan will be to try to uh, eradicate it. In any place that can catch them early, if you can eradicate it, that will be uh, good. Otherwise, you'll have to wait for a while until you have a large enough population of Japanese beetle that you can do an introduction of these uh, uh, con control organisms and then get them established and hopefully they would do natural suppression for you over the long term. So in the areas where you think you might have Japanese beetle um, uh, then you can put out monitoring traps. Uh, in areas where it's established uh, you can't really do much good. Uh, you don't get a high enough percentage to come in and, and die in these traps uh, to put a dent in a well-established population. And, and actually, they, uh, the joke is back east is uh, if you have somebody you don't like, you give them a Japanese beetle trap because that will bring in a whole bunch of beetles. The, the, you know, sure, some will die in the trap, but a bunch more will be eating their plants. Uh, so uh, one of the things that was interesting when I was researching this is uh, they're trying to improve the Japanese monitoring traps uh, so they don't catch and kill uh, many beneficial insects because unfortunately uh, the same kinds of lures that are used that are attractive to the Japanese beetles um, uh, can also attract in things that are beneficial like bumblebees. So again, they've been trying to do some uh, uh, studies on what kind of trap you can utilize where you can still monitor for Japanese beetles successfully and yet uh, not uh, catch your beneficial organisms. So again, that uh, if you're interested, uh, then this uh, article from Entomology Today uh, is a good read. Another good read is this fact sheet from Colorado State University. As I said, the Front Range has been dealing with Japanese beetles since the 1990s. And uh, uh, again, with uh, Professor Whitney Cranshaw down there, who is a leading expert in, in urban entomology and in horticultural entomology, uh, uh, they they know quite a bit about them. And uh, again, this uh, fact sheet can be found at this uh, web address here. Um, so uh, again, um, if you want to learn more about Japanese beetle, uh, this is an excellent resource that you can go there and, and um, uh, read. So by now you probably have figured out that the only hope to eradicate Japanese beetles is to find them when they first arrive in your town. Uh, if you find one or you suspect you found one, uh, let somebody know about it. And those yeah, people that uh, would be appropriate would be uh, the you know, Wyoming Department of Department of Agriculture, the Wyoming State Forestry Department, uh, your county weed and pest office, um, uh, your local UW Extension educators, um, the uh, to myself with the, at the university, there's my contact information. Uh, we also have the uh, Cooperative Ag Pest Survey Program. Uh, again, um, you know, let us know so we can then take the appropriate steps to. Number one, determine is the Japanese beetle, and if it is, how far along are they, and can they be eradicated? Certainly, it's a uh, there's too many invasive insects, and and not enough people um, uh, to uh, stop them. Uh, so, any help that we can get from the the citizens uh, of the great state of Wyoming to uh, protect our horticulture is, is highly appreciated and uh, thank you for your time and uh, if you need to contact me for uh, questions on Japanese beetle or any other type of insect or other arthropod uh, uh, questions uh, here's my contact information and I'll be happy uh, to uh, try to assist you.